order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Mike Amesbury. Yeah. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Yeah. The Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, uh, thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I hope it is not... I hope it's not too late to wish all members and staff in the House a very happy New Year. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mike Amesbury. I too would like to wish members of staff a happy New Year. Um, at least 1.4 million households across the UK have been <coughs> victims of unfair practices in the leasehold market, including my constituent, Emily Martin. In advance of any intended legislation, what commitment will the Prime Minister make to ensure that Emily and thousands of people tied into this pit-like scandal yeah. are compensated by developers now? Yeah. Yeah. I, can I say to the honourable gentleman that we are concerned when we hear of unfair practices taking place? I am sure that the housing secretary will be happy to hear of the particular case as an example of this. We are looking to see what uh, action the government can take to ensure that people are secure in their homes and that they are not subject to practices that they should not be subject to. James Cleverly. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, in December, when the Brexit Secretary met Michel Barnier, uh, they hugged. Uh, in that spirit, uh, would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, passionately embrace uh, – not me, Mr Speaker, don't worry – would she passionately embrace the agenda that she set out last year to build a Britain fit for the future, to encourage home ownership, improve education and health and life chances, and leave this – country in a better place than when we found it. Well, I, I have to say to my honourable friend, um, he talks about passionate embraces. I don't think he's ever had the kiss that he once asked for. <laughs> um, but he's, um, if I may say, he's absolutely, he's absolutely right. We are determined to deliver a Britain that is fit for the future, and that does mean we need to get Brexit right, but it means we need to do a lot more. He references house building. Yes, we are committed to building the homes that this country needs. That's why we've put £15 billion of new financial support available over the next five years. It's why we've scrapped stamp duty for 80% of first-time buyers. We're also improving school standards. 1.9 million more children in good or outstanding schools today and we're protecting our natural environment. We're building a Britain that can look to the future with optimism and hope. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Right, Mr Speaker, could I wish you and all the House and all our staff a very happy New Year? Yeah. Everybody's agreed? Yeah? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just to, uh, Mr Speaker, I know it seems a long time ago I know it seems a long time ago, but just before Christmas, I asked the Prime Minister about the 12,000 people left waiting more than half an hour in the back of an ambulance at A&E departments. She told the House the NHS was better prepared for winter than ever before. So what words of comfort does the Prime Minister have to the 17,000 patients waiting in the back of ambulances in the last week of December? Is it that nothing is perfect by any chance? I fully accept that the NHS is uh, under pressure over winter. It uh, is regularly under pressure at winter times. Uh, I have been very I've been very clear. I apologise to those people who've had their operations delayed and to those people who have had their admissions to hospital delayed. Uh, but it is indeed the case that the NHS was better prepared this winter than ever before. And it might be helpful. Yes. It might be helpful if I let the House know some of the, is some of the things that were done in order to ensure that preparedness. Yes. More people than ever before having flu vaccines, 2,700 more acute beds being, available since no being made available since November. For the first time ever, for the first time ever, we have seen GP, urgent GP appointments available across the Christmas period across this country. 
more doctors specialising in treating the elderly in accident and emergency. But the, the right honourable gentleman mentions the last exchange that we had in this House. In our last exchange, he said mental health budgets have been cut. That is not right. Simon Stevens from the National Health Service has made clear that mental health spending has gone up both in real terms and as a proportion of the overall spending. So will he now apologise for what he previously said? Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister knows full well that CAM's budgets have been raided and that many people that need help are not getting that help. And Mr Speaker, we saw on ITV News the other night that nurses are spending their entire shift treating people in car parks because of backed-up ambulances. We know the Prime Minister recognises there's a crisis in our NHS because she wanted to sack the Health Secretary last week but was too weak to do it. And if the NHS is so well resourced and so well prepared, why was a decision taken last week to cancel the operations of 55,000 patients during the month of January? I say to the right honourable gentleman. Well, from the front bench, the Labour Party say apologise. Actually, uh, if uh, he would had listened to the answer that I gave to his right honourable friend, the Leader of the Opposition, I have made clear that I have already apologised to those whose operations have been delayed, and we will make sure that those operations are reinstated as soon as possible. We are putting record funding into the NHS and record funding into mental health. But he keeps on about the preparations for the National Health Service. I was very pleased, I was very pleased last week to be able to go and say in person a thank you to staff at Frimley Health Trust from both Frimley Park Park and Wexham Park hospitals for the work that they have been doing to deliver for patients across this period of particular pressure across the winter. Our NHS staff, and that's not just doctors and nurses, it's support staff like radiographers, it's administrative staff, it's porters, it's everybody working in our National Health Service do a fantastic job day in and day out, and they particularly do that when, they're un- when we see these winter pressures. But in terms of being prepared, this is what NHS providers said only last week. Preparations for winter in the NHS have been more extensive and meticulous than ever before. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, we all thank all NHS staff for what they do. But the reality is that the 55,000 operations cancelled means that those 55,000 people joined the already 4 million waiting for operations within the NHS. Perhaps the Prime Minister could listen to the experience of Vicky. Her 82-year-old mother spent 13 hours on a trolley in a corridor. That was on top of the three hours between her first calling 999 and arriving at hospital. Vicky says, and I quote, a volunteer first responder from Warwickshire Heart Service whose day job is in the army kept mum safe until paramedics arrived. Her mother then suffered a heart attack just a week before. This is not an isolated case. Does the Prime Minister really believe the NHS is better prepared than ever for the crisis it's now going through? First of all, can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that nobody wants to hear people having to experience what uh, Vicky and her mother had experienced. And of course, and of course, we need to ensure that we learn from these, uh, from these incidents, and that's exactly what we do in the National Health Service. And I'm very happy to ensure that that particular case is looked at, if he would like to uh, uh, provide me with the details of that particular case. But week in and week out in the run-up to Christmas and now today, what the Right Honourable Gentleman is doing is giving an impression of a National Health Service that is failing everybody that goes to use the NHS. The reality in our NHS is that we are seeing 2.9 million more people now going to accident and emergency. We're seeing over 2 million more operations taking place each year. 
our National Health Service is something that we should be proud of, and that is why it is a first class it is a first class national health service a first class national health service that has been identified as the number one health system in the world that means it's a better health system than australia the netherlands new zealand canada switzerland sweden france germany and the united states of america Speaker, we are all on this side of the House very proud of the principle of the National Health Service, health care as a human right. But the reality is that in the past year, 565,000 people have spent time on trolleys yeah. when they should be treated. Absolutely. The number of elderly people being rushed into A&E from care homes has risen by 62 per cent since the Tories took power. Care Quality Commission figures suggest that nearly a quarter of homes need improvement. Not only is this robbing older people of their dignity, but it's putting pressure on A&Es and on ambulance services. So why, instead of dealing with the social care crisis, has the Prime Minister rewarded the Health Secretary with a promotion and a new job title? Can I say to the right honourable gentleman that I think there are many voices across this House, including those from his own party, who have been encouraging me to ensure that we see better integration between health and social care. I am pleased that we have recognised this by making the Department of Health the Department for Health and Social Care, and that, that has been recognised by Age UK, who have said that this is a welcome and long overdue recognition of the interdependence of health and social care. I saw for myself last week at Frimley Park the good work that is being done by some hospitals up and down the country, working with GPs, working with care homes, working with the voluntary sector to ensure that elderly people can stay at home safely and do not need to come into hospital with all the, uh, all the consequences of them coming into hospital beds. That is the way forward. That is what we want to do, ensuring that we are seeing that integration of health and social care at the grassroots level. But the, national, the, way, the way the Right Honourable Gentleman talks, you would think that the Labour Party had all the solutions for the National Health Service. If the Labour Party, if the Labour Party have got, got all the answers, why is it that we see funding being cut, uh, targets not being met in Wales, where the Labour Party is responsible? Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister leads a government that is responsible for the funding of national governments such as in Wales. She knows full well what has been cut from Wales. But she is, Mr Speaker, directly responsible she is, Mr. Speaker, directly responsible for the NHS in England. And giving the Health Secretary a new job title won't hide the fact that £6 billion, six billion has been cut from social care under the Tories. Part, Mr. Speaker, part of the problem with the NHS is that its funds are being increasingly siphoned off into private companies, including in the Health Secretary's area of Surrey. Order, order, Mr. Shelbrook, calm yourself, man. You're supposed to be auditioning to become an elder statesman. But there are many more auditions to come on President Evidence. Calm yourself, it will be good for your health. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr. Speaker, even more money is being siphoned out of our NHS budgets into private health companies. Even in the Health Secretary's area of Surrey, the, a clinical commissioning group was forced to pay money to Virgin Care because it did not win a contract. Will the Prime Minister assure patients that in 2018 less NHS money intended for patient care will be feathering the nests of shareholders in private health companies? Yeah. Gentlemen, first of all, on Wales, this government has given more money to the Welsh government. It is a decision, a decision of Labour in Wales to deprioritise funding for the National Health Service in Wales. And on the issue of, and on the issue of the uh, private sector and its role in the health service, under which government was it that private private uh, access and private use of private sector? Order! Order! Let me order! I say to the Shadow Secretary of State for Health, he too 
is supposed to be auditioning for something. <laughs> he's, a, he's, normally, he's normally a very amiable fellow, but he's gesticulating in a, a very eccentric fashion. He must calm himself. It's not necessary. It's not good for his image. <laughs> Prime Minister. I say to the right honourable gentleman, first of all, we've put more money into Wales, but the Labour government in Wales has decided to deprioritise funding for the National Health Service. And the increase that was seen in private sector companies working in the health service wasn't under the Conservative government, it was under a Labour government of which the right honourable gentleman was a member. Jeremy Corbyn! Uh, my honourable friend, my honourable friend, the Shadow Health Secretary, is auditioning to be Health Secretary, and he shows real passion. For our NHS. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, under this government, Virgin Care got £200 million worth of contracts in the last year alone, 50% up on the year before. Yes. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister needs to understand that it's her policies that are pushing our NHS into crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Tax cuts for the super rich and big business are paid for, yes, Mr. Speaker, they're paid for by longer waiting lists, ambulance delays, staff shortages, and cuts to social care. Creeping privatisation is dragging our NHS down. The Health Secretary. The Health Secretary, during his occupation of her office to keep his job, said he won't abandon the ship. Isn't that an admission that under his captaincy, the ship is indeed sinking? We, uh, this government is putting more money into the National Health Service. We see more doctors in our NHS, more nurses in our NHS, more operations taking place in our NHS, more people being treated in accident and emergency in our NHS. But we can only do that. We can only do that if we have a strong economy. And what would we see from the Labour Party? We've turned the economy round from the recession that the Labour Party left us with. What do we know? What do we know about the Labour Party's economic policies? Well, we were told all about them from the description from the Shadow Education Secretary, who I see is not in her place on the front bench today. The sh- oh, I'm, I do apologise. I, no, I. I didn't realise, Mr Speaker, I did not realise the Shadow Education Secretary was herself undergoing medical treatment. I I apologise unreservedly for that comment. Um, But I do have to say that she did describe the uh, economic policies of the Labour Party in unparliamentary terms. It did include the word bust, uh, but she did say that the Labour Party's economic policy was high risk. Now, that means high risk for taxpayers, high risk for jobs, and high risk for our NHS. And and that's a risk we will never let them take. David Morris! Thank you, Mr Speaker. On to a positive note on the NHS. My NHS trust, Morecambe Bay, has turned around from being one of the worst trusts in the country, and it was safe to say that five years ago, to one of the best. That was because of injections of huge amounts of cash, but the staff there were amazing. They turned that hospital around. And Jackie Daniels, the chief... No, order. Can I just gently invite the honourable gentleman to be sensitive to time? What we want is not a long spiel, but a short question with a question mark at the end of it. David Morris. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Jackie Daniel, Jackie Daniel has received a damehood for turning around Morecambe Bay Trust. Very positive, along with the staff. Would my honourable friend, the Prime Minister? Look forward to working with her successor and carry on turning around Morecambe Bay Trust and wish Jackie well. I'm happy, I'm happy to join my honourable friend in uh, paying tribute to the work of the staff at the uh, Morecambe Bay Trust and particularly to wish well, uh, Dame Jackie well and to recognise and pay tribute to the work that she's done in turning that trust around. It's just another example of the huge gratitude that we owe to our NHS staff who work so tirelessly on our behalf. Blackford! Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I wish you, all staff and all members, a good new year? Mr Speaker, the government's EU withdrawal bill is quite simply not fit for purpose and must be changed. 
These are not my words. These are the words of the honourable member for East Renfrewshire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does the yeah, prime yeah, minister yeah, yeah. agree with her colleague yeah. that we must amend clause 11, which is nothing more than a pearl grab from Scotland? Uh, uh, the honourable gentleman knows full well that we have uh, said that we will look to improve clause 11. Indeed, if he was in his, if he was in his place when my right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, was answering questions earlier, he made it very clear that we continue to look to amend clause 11. We are, however, and this is something I discussed with the First Minister before Christmas, we are looking to work with the devolved administrations to ensure that we put the right frameworks in place so that when we come to bring any amendment forward, it is in the best pos- being done in the best possible way in the interest of all concerned. I thought that had been accepted by the SNP, but we will be looking to bring forward amendments in the Lords. Ian Blackford. Mr Speaker, that simply is not good enough. The Secretary of State for Scotland promised a powers bonanza for Scotland and that, crucially, amendments would be tabled ahead of next week's debate. Yesterday, it was revealed that no amendments would be lodged. The Tories always promise Scotland everything and deliver nothing. The Prime Minister has one last chance. Will she assure the House that these amendments will be tabled ahead of next week, as promised? The the SNP say they want to work with us on on the frameworks, on the future frameworks, and we are doing exactly that. They say they want Clause 11 amended, and we are doing exactly that. My right honourable friend is intensifying his discussions with the Scottish Government and indeed with the, uh, uh, with the executive in Wales as, a, as, uh, as part of this. We will be bringing forward amendments, but the honourable gentleman says that this is a government that never delivers for Scotland. Two billion pounds extra as a result of the budget, that's delivering for Scotland. Stephen Kerr! Mr Speaker, speaking of delivering for Scotland, yep. the Stirling and Clackmanninshire City Region deal is a massive investment in Scotland's economy yeah. and a huge yeah. vote of confidence in Scotland yeah, yeah. by a Conservative and Unionist government. Yeah. With, with, with projects like the UK Institute for Aquaculture and the National Tartan Centre, yeah. which will have UK wide impact and global reach, will the Prime Minister confirm to me today now that the UK Government is ready to sign off the heads of agreement with the Scottish Government and the local councils so that we can get to work. I'm very happy to to give that uh, commitment to my honourable friend and to say this is another example of how this is a government that is delivering for Scotland. I know the importance of uh, uh, this particular deal, the Stirling and Clackmanninshire deal. It will be transformative. My honourable friend has championed this call since he became elected. He's doing a great job for his uh, constituents and we're all working to get an agreement as soon as possible. Emma Hardy. Thank you. Mr Speaker, I have been contacted by 11 constituents who are frightened and many of them suicidal because they have been told by either Hull or East Riding CCG that their desperately needed pain infusion treatment will be stopped. This is the cruel reality of the NHS having to ration treatment due to funding cuts. Will the Prime Minister personally intervene to ensure Hull and East Riding CCG review their decision and guarantee them the additional funding to allow them to deliver it? Can I say to the Honourable Lady that we are putting extra money into the National Health Service? We are not cutting the funding for the National Health Service. CCGs, CCGs will Will be, taking, will be taking individual decisions about how they apportion their funding, but to stand up here and suggest that we are cutting funding to the National Health Service is plain wrong. Yeah. Lucy Allen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <coughs> Telford is a rapidly growing new town where thousands of new houses are built every year, and people come to Telford to buy their home on a new build estate and live their dream. But for far too many, the reality is unfinished communal areas, unadopted roads, non-compliance with Section 106, developers (coughs) failing to take responsibility, and the local council passing the buck. 
Colleagues across the House see similar problems in their constituencies. Will the Prime Minister agree to strengthen the rights of homeowners on new build estates so people can come to Telford or to any other new build area and buy a new build home confident they can live their dream? Yes. Yes, well, I'm, I'm uh, happy to say to my honourable friend that, of course, we recognise the concern that she has raised. I think this was a similar issue that the honourable member for Weaver Vale was raising in the first question that he asked. Um, I understand, by the way, it's Telford's 50th anniversary, so I congratulate Telford on its 50th anniversary. We are committed to legislating in relation to the unfair practice that she's identified, because it's only fair that freeholders should have the same rights as leaseholders to challenge the reasonableness of the service charges that they're being uh, submitted to. Wishart. On a scale between 1 to 10, how does the Prime Minister think her Brexit is going, with 10 being all going perfectly, we know what we want to achieve and we know how to get it, and 1 being chaotic cluelessness? I know what I'd give the Prime Minister. What would she give herself? Can I say to the honourable gentleman that I think... I think just say to the honourable gentleman who I've known for a long time, I think when he comes to reflect on his conduct, he'll know he can do better than that. Yeah. He can do better than that. The Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I say to the, uh, the honourable gentleman that I think anybody who saw the success we had in negotiating phase one of Brexit and getting that sufficient progress will say that actually this is a government that knows what it's doing and is getting on with the job and is doing well. Cheryl Gillan. Environmentalists across the UK were absolutely delighted with the announcement of cooperation with the Woodland Trust to develop the new northern forest. But will the Prime Minister give assurances that plans to create new landscapes will not obscure the need to protect existing areas of outstanding natural beauty? And will she confirm her commitment to protect the Chilterns AONB as we pursue the government's economic and housing development plans? Can I say to my right honourable friend, first of all, I'd like to congratulate her on uh, becoming a dame in the recent years. Honours. That is a very, very well deserved. I can assure her that we are committed to maintaining the strongest protection for areas of outstanding natural beauty and other designated landscapes. And as regards the Chilterns AONB, I have to say to her, I do enjoy walking in the Chilterns myself. I recognise the value of that particular environment, and we are committed to protecting AONBs. Selma Walker! Thank you, Mr Speaker. I was a teacher and a head teacher for 34 years, yeah. so I know that I speak on behalf of thousands of teachers yeah. and support staff when I ask Prime Minister. In light of the recent announcement of a fall in teacher training application numbers yeah. by a third, will the government listen to professionals and fully and fairly fund our schools and colleges, end the toxic culture of targets and tests, deliver a broad and balanced curriculum and, most of all, return the joy of teaching and learning back to our classrooms? I say to the Honourable Lady that we are putting record sums of money into our schools. We are ensuring that more than that, more than that, we are ensuring that we are seeing increasing standards in our schools. That is why today there are 1.9 million more children in good or outstanding schools than in 2010, and I hope she would welcome that. Evan Foster. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will be aware there is great potential in the South West to increase prosperity and productivity. Will she therefore confirm how her government will be back in the South West, in particular the need to invest in our vital road, rail and digital infrastructure? My, my hon. Friend is absolutely right, and he is a great champion for the needs of the South West. And uh, we do want to increase prosperity and productivity in the South West, and indeed right across the country, but we are taking some particular steps. We have obviously, across uh, 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 the country we're committing significant sums of money in relation to infrastructure investment and road investment strategy and we're committed to creating an expressway to the southwest this i think will be part of an important uh, development investing more than 400 million into the rail network in the area 
and I'm pleased to say over 600,000 homes and businesses in the South West now have access to superfast broadband as a result of our superfast broadband programme. There's more we can do for the South West, and I look forward to working with my honourable friend in doing that. Yeah. Luciana Berger. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Health Secretary said that the Government wanted to be the best in the world for cancer diagnosis, treatment and care. Today, according to a memo from the Head of Chemotherapy at Oxford Churchill Hospital, terminally ill cancer patients will have their chemotherapy cut because of a massive shortfall in, in specialist nurses. Will the Prime Minister apologise to cancer patients and their families for this appalling situation? Yeah. Well, I say to the Honourable Lady that the Trust has made clear there are absolutely no plans to delay the start of chemotherapy treatment or reduce the number of cycles of treatment given to cancer patients. Uh, but what, again, what Simon Stevens has said is happening in the NHS in relation to this is over the past three years, highest cancer survival rates ever. Latest survival figures show an estimated more than 7,000 more people surviving cancer after successful NHS cancer treatment compared to three years prior. And we do see more, 3,200 more diagnostic and therapeutic radiographers than in May 2010. So we will continue to look at this, but we're continuing to put the funding in that's enabling us to improve our treatment for cancer patients. Dr Andrew Murison. Mr Speaker, with record funding, our NHS is doing more than than ever. Yeah. But, yeah. but when the UK is in the bottom third of countries for heart attack deaths, when we have significantly worse survival for stroke than France and Germany, and when our closest match for cancer survival is Chile and Poland, is it not time to act on calls from across this House and back this week by the Centre for Policy Studies to establish a Royal Commission on Health and Social Care in this, the 70th anniversary year of our most cherished national institution. Oh, my, my honourable friend is right that we continue, need to continue to look at, at the uh, National Health Service and ensure that we are continuing to improve the performance in a variety of areas. The Independent Commonwealth Fund has been clear that the National Health Service is the best healthcare system in the world, that it is better than systems such as those in Germany and France and, and the list of other countries that I quoted earlier. Uh, but of course, we need to do, look at what more we can do. That's why we're putting more funding in. That's why we're looking at the uh, better integration of health and social care on the ground. It's about making sure we're making a change now and doing that integration now, because that's when it's going to make a difference to people. Graham Morris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. That the Prime Minister said that she'd reshuffled her ministers so they look like, more like the country they seek to represent. I, I'm not quite sure about that, but in that spirit, <laughs> will she acknowledge the massive problems we have with the private rented sector, with absentee private landlords? And will she commit to come to visit Easington to gain her own appreciation of the scale of the problems facing many working class communities. And in the spirit of goodwill, will she support and give free passage to the bill on, on the, uh, um, uh, homes fit for habitation uh, being promoted by my honourable friend, the member for Westminster North? Well, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I have many uh, fond memories of the time I spent in the North East when uh, I was a candidate up in the North East, working with those. Uh, but we, we, do, we do need to ensure, we do need to ensure that we have, we do need to ensure that we have a good private rented sector in this country. I have to say to him, though, that the one set of policies which would damage the private rented sector are the policies put forward by his leader of the opposition. Oh, Grant! Thank you, Mr Speaker. I was delighted to hear the Environment Secretary last week confirm this Government's commitment to supporting farmers after we leave the European Union. Can my right honourable friend assure me that when designing a future system, the unique needs of Scottish farmers and indeed crofters will be taken into account in any such new system? Thank you. Well, my honourable friend is right that, of course, as we leave the European Union, we will be able to put in place our own uh, policy of support for farmers. We want that to be a policy that recognises the particular needs of farmers across all parts of the United Kingdom, and, of course, that will include the particular needs of farmers in Scotland. Gerald Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituency office and local citizens' advice bureau are receiving ever-increasing complaints about PIP claims. Assessments are being refused, and currently 65% of claims are overturned 
on appeal at tribunal. Yeah. Growing number of appeals means that tribunals have taken longer, anything between four and seven months. Can I ask the Prime Minister if she agrees that the PIP assessment process is fundamentally flawed and what action she can take to avoid unnecessary expense of court and, more importantly, the undue stress and hardship being caused to my constituents and those across the country? Well, I, I understand the point that the honourable gentleman is making about ensuring, as we want to, that these assessments are being conducted as well as they can, and that people are getting the uh, are getting the awards that they are in fact uh, should be getting and that they are entitled to. Um, in fact, since we introduced the personal independence payment, we've carried out around 2.9 million assessments. Um, Eight percent of those have been appealed, and but only 4% of those decisions are changed following an appeal. In the majority of cases, it is because new evidence is presented at the appeal than was presented when the original case was being put forward. But, of course, the Department for Work and and Pensions continues to look at ensuring that when these assessments are made, they are done properly and that people get the right results. Goldfield. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent Justin Bartholomew was just 25 when he committed suicide late last year. His family are convinced that his intake of high energy drinks over 15 cans a day increased his anxiety and contributed to his death. Given the increased safety concern around the high energy drink market and the actions of people like Jamie Oliver and Waitrose, would the Prime Minister consider introducing a national ban on the sale of these energy drinks for under 16s? My honourable friend has raised a tragic case, and I know that the thoughts and sympathies of the whole House will be with the family and friends of Justin Bartholomew. Uh, Of course, we have introduced the um, soft drinks industry levy. We do recognise that there are issues around uh, drinks that are high in sugar, and we know that energy drinks high in sugar can be damaging to uh, children's health. We are supporting schools and and parents to make healthier choices and to be able to uh, uh, identify those through clearer labelling, through campaigns. But, of course, this is an issue that the Department of Health and Social Care will continue to look at, and they will continue to look at the scientific evidence in relation to these drinks. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I have a constituent that escaped an abusive relationship and has been passed from pillar to post between the old child support agency and the new child maintenance service. Now, after four and a half years of this, she has now been told by the CMS that she has to start the whole process all over again. And on top of that, they are insisting that she passes on her personal and her bank details directly to her ex-partner to receive payment. So will the Prime Minister agree to help to resolve this problem and agree to look at the system that has allowed this abuse to continue? Yeah. Yeah. I say to the Honourable Lady that obviously she raises um, a distressing case. I, I recognise I mean, there are uh, arrangements in place which would ensure that an individual would not, as I understand it, have to pass their bank details on directly. The fact that her constituent has been asked to do that, I think, is something that should be looked into. And I'm sure if she passes those uh, details to the appropriate department, they will look into it. Colin Clark. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Does the Prime Minister welcome the findings of the Social Research Survey that the majority of Scots believe that? believe the rules on trade and immigration should be the same in Scotland as in the rest of the UK. It looks like they agree we are better together. Well, I, I, I think my honourable friend has raised a very important point. People across the UK want to see controlled immigration. That's people in Scotland as well as people in the rest of the United Kingdom. And as we leave the European Union, we'll be able to introduce our own immigration rules and control that immigration from, uh, to Britain from Europe. The, the only point of differentiation is, of course, we do have a Scottish, uh, Scotti- Scotland-only shortage occupation list to recognise the particular labour market needs uh, in uh, Scotland. But for the most part, that has actually matched the UK-wide uh, shortage occupation list. And I think that shows this is an issue for the whole of the UK, and we need the same a policy approach. Mr. Speaker, in a March 2005 interview, the Prime Minister said, not getting things done and seeing people's lives hurt by government bureaucracy makes her depressed. In light of this comment, can the Prime Minister tell me whether she considers it reasonable and acceptable for the DVLA to withhold my constituent, Mr Coleman's licence, for over 18 months, despite evidence showing he was fit and able to drive, as she has not responded to my letter of 5 December? First of all, I will ensure that the Honourable Lady receives a response to the letter that she has sent me. Obviously, she has raised a particular case in this uh, House. I will need to look at the details of that case, and I will respond to her letter. Simon Clark. Mr. Speaker, last 
week, Kevin Potash announced 230 job losses at Bowlby Mine in my constituency. This is devastating for Loftus and the wider East Cleveland community, where the mine is by far and away the largest employer. Tees Valley Mayor Ben Houchen, the Honourable Member for Redcar and myself were all agreed it would be incredibly helpful if some of the funds remaining from the 2015 SSI rescue package could be repurposed to support people leaving Bowlby. Will the Prime Minister agree to look into this with the Business Secretary and will she commit that government agencies will do everything they can to support people affected by this dreadful news? Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, my honourable friend is right to raise this case. It's obviously a worrying time for the workers that are affected by the announcement from uh, Cleveland Potash. And uh, I can say to him that we will be helping people to find uh, other work and supporting those affected by through the DWP's rapid response service. We will also coordinate with the Tees Value Combined Authority to ensure that we're working together to get the uh, best possible support available uh, to make that support, sure that support is aligned. But the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy will look uh, at the situation and will look at the specific issue that he has raised. Well, McDonough. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Ava has been a foster carer for years. When her privately rented home failed the electrical certificate needed to continue fostering, her landlord evicted her because he did not want to do the repairs. So now Ava and the kids are living in temp council temporary accommodation in a converted warehouse in the middle of a working industrial estate in Mitcham. And the same council who placed her there are going to withdraw her right to foster because her accommodation is not good enough. Can the Prime Minister tell Ava? Kids in care who need foster carers and the, and the overworked British taxpayer, how this makes sense. Yes. Yeah. I, have to, I have to say, as the Honourable Lady has set it out, it does not appear to make sense that we will be, as a result of what has happened, losing somebody who has been a foster carer. And I'd like to pay tribute to what her, the work that her constituent has done in, fo in uh, foster caring. Uh, we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to those who are, uh, care for people as foster parents. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that as she's raised this in the House, I'm sure the local council will want to look at this again. Finally, Richard Grosvenor Plunkett, Early Earl Drax. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> while most of us were while most of us were celebrating over New Year's Eve, Mr. Speaker, the crews of the pool-based tug Kingston and the Swanage and Weymouth lifeboats were battling mountainous seas and 70 mile an hour winds off the coast of Dorset to prevent a cargo ship from being blown onto the rocks. Thanks to the skill of the tug's crew and the tow was fixed and a disaster prevented. Will my right honourable friend join me in praising the professionalism, courage, determination of all those involved, not least the volunteers of the RNLI? Yeah. I'm, I'm very happy to do that, to praise all those who are involved in averting a disaster, uh, both the tug crew and those in, uh, involved in the RNLI. Indeed, I'd like to go further. Those volunteers in the RNLI do a fantastic job around our coastlines day in and day out, and we owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Thank you.